You've been noticing how much goddamn AI content there is out there at the moment. Well, a really interesting thing is the way that this affects our ability to have knowledge. Now, this little graph here is just showing the number of AI created images as of August 2023, and you can imagine by now it's probably even more than that. Um, and this is just a few platforms uh, from, from Adobe. But what I want to talk about today is how this affects our knowledge, how this uh, impacts philosophy. So there's a really interesting article that I read uh, for uni actually about uh, deep fakes and epistemology. So epistemology, for those of you who don't know, is essentially the study of knowledge. What can we know, right? So this article by someone called Regina Rini analyzes the issue of how uh, knowledge is affected by deep fakes. So the fundamental question is, if we can generate fake videos which look real, and we can do this of pretty much everything and anyone, we can pretend that anyone has said anything, how can we ever know what is real? Now, particularly if you think about this in like a political context, like say the uh, US presidential debates happened today, you know, uh, there were, they fact checked them both uh, a couple of times from memory. And, you know, if, how are we able to fact check people if we can just fake every single video, every single audio recording? How can we ever trust anything, right? Um, because, you know, no matter what, whenever someone makes a claim, someone else will go, oh, well, that's just fake. It's fake news, right? Um, so this is a really big problem. Now, I'm going to get into the terminology that Rini uses here. So she calls this the epistemic backstop, right? So essentially, we're differentiating between two types of knowledge here. We've got perceptual knowledge, which is like the knowledge of, of your senses, so what you're immediately taking in, and also testimonial knowledge. Now, the interesting thing about uh, perceptual knowledge is that we can kind of also receive it through things like photos and videos, right? Assuming that they're real. Because what we're doing when we're looking at a video or a photo or hearing an audio recording is we're getting an objective snapshot of what was happening in that place at that time. So this is the epistemic backstop. Now, essentially, the reason why we need this is because we're pretty reliant on testimonial accounts of things to provide us with knowledge. And we need these to be reliable, right? So if you consider that every single piece of information about things which aren't immediately in front of you is in some way essentially given to you through testimony. Um, maybe it's someone telling you, maybe it's someone, uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to be someone telling you really that that's what testimony is. But the only other way is through direct video footage or audio recordings. Um, these are the only ways that we can directly know anything. And this is particularly relevant in the public sphere. So whenever there's some sort of public event, whether it be um, some sort of like, say there's a protest, right, in your city. Well, the way that you know that it happened is because you see video of it. You see video of the protesters marching through the streets and that sort of a thing. So um, the purpose of the epistemic backstop of these videos and audio recordings and photos is that they provide that objective account, which then means that testimony is held to account in some way. So people can't just make random claims without there being the chance that, well, maybe there's video of it, maybe there's an audio recording of it, something like this. You know, you can think of um, like a legal trial, right, where someone makes a false claim and then someone brings out the video and they're like, well, actually, you know, we've got you on video uh, and you're lying. You know, this is the, the purpose of these technologies of being able to record things is that we then can have this objective account, which then means that people are incentivized to be honest in their testimony, because if they aren't, they risk being found out and, you know, they face both legal and social repercussions for that. So a really interesting point that Rini raises is that the real problem actually is not that people will believe that AI images and videos and that sort of thing are real, because, you know, they're currently not flawless, um, and perhaps they never can be. Perhaps there's some sort of, you know, exponential uh, barrier to them never quite being there. Um, but the problem actually comes uh, in the authority of these videos and audio recordings and photos, uh, just as a whole being diminished, because immediately we will start having this suspicion um, and this skepticism about the truth 
claims made by these photos and videos uh, and audio recordings. They may become mere testimonial accounts rather than a kind of proxy way of gaining perceptual knowledge like we were talking about before, because the second that we can't trust them to give us perceptual knowledge, well then they become testimony, because we can't be completely sure that these are the objective way that events played out. Maybe they've been edited in some way. You know, there's always going to be that thought in the back of your mind. So how can you ever trust them if you're instinctively suspicious that they might have been faked? Because you know that technology exists now, right? So, therefore, we no longer will have the same incentives to provide an honest testimony, which, uh, you know, has really concerning implications for our ability to be certain about public events, uh, particularly when you think about, like, the legal system. Um, we can see how this could be really problematic, because if someone is able to fake videos, then they can potentially get away with anything. Um, and I guess the opposite is true as well, you know, if you can fake videos, you can convict anyone of anything, which is almost, you know, just as frightening. Um, and the reason why AI is particularly concerning, um, you know, we might think that, well, editing technology has been around for a really long time. Um, there are accounts of uh, photographs being edited uh, back in the Soviet Union to to alter events uh, that Rini talks about. Um, so that's been like, you know, a thing for a really, really long time where photographs actually haven't been all that trustworthy. And we can also think about like, um, you know, the conspiracy theorists with the moon landing talking about how, oh, well, maybe it's just Hollywood special effects. Now, these do provide a sort of doubt, particularly for photos. Um, but the good thing is that... Um, Special effects in film, historically, are really expensive and time-consuming to create. You can't just, like, whip out um, 2001 A Space Odyssey. You can't whip out the moon landing. It, like, if it, were, if it were faked, which it's not, but if it were, you know, you can't just whip that out in, in 20 minutes, you know? Um, and secondly, because photos are able to be edited in this way, and, you know, we've had Photoshop for quite a long time now, uh, we've historically been able to use videos and audio recordings to verify the testimony of photos. So the, the distinction with AI is that well, we can create it really quickly, like, just like that, you know, you, you enter your text and then it's essentially text-to-speech with, with the AI audio clips at the moment. Um, you know, and as I mentioned at the start, the amount of AI videos, particularly it seems like shorts that you see these days where um, it, it's all just done by AI, you know, even the writing of it, it seems like half the time is done by AI because there's horrendous grammar and it, it's just crap. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's very easy. And whilst the video component is tricky, you know, deep fakes and that sort of thing, it's not necessarily as easy as the AI audio clips are at the moment. Um, it's not unreasonable to think that at some point, you know, five, ten years down the, down the line, that it won't be that much more difficult than the AI audio clips are at the moment. Um, we can just think about something like uh, the text-to-image stuff on, on things like uh, ChatGPT and think, well, if we can just generate 24 of those a second, we've got a video, you know, and so long as we can perfectly imitate someone's face uh, on them, which, you know, some of them do a pretty good job of, of making faces, uh, it's not unreasonable to think that, that that could be really simple in not that, not that far into the future. So, I mean, should we be worried? I mean, I've, I think I've painted a pretty uh, dire account of things thus far. Um, but I think there are two ways to think about the issue. So, the first is that, well, perhaps this all doesn't actually matter. Um, we, we existed before cameras and stuff, and we had legal processes, we had ways to uh, encourage honest testimony. Um, and this is kind of what really seems to suggest is that, well, maybe we just need to look at those and, and go back to those ways, although she does also mention that uh, her concern is that, like, transitioning back to, to finding those previous ways of uh, being able to found knowledge uh, in testimony is, it, yeah, that transition period might be a bit shaky and might be really difficult. Um, and 
Another position which, which I considered is that supposing that AI-generated content can always be detected, which, I mean, is kind of a big supposition, but let's say it can be. Um, we could say that then the epistemic backstop has merely shifted such that uh, the detection technology informs us of what we can and cannot use as perceptual knowledge. So in a similar way to we were talking before about photos uh, using videos as verification, it could just be a similar thing. Um, and, you know, much in the same way, we could we could allow some sort of margin for error there where maybe some slip through the cracks. Um, but, you know, so long as it's mostly uh, up to scratch and mostly detects the AI content, um, it seems like we'd be in a similar situation. And perhaps we could, in that sense, use uh, verified videos as a, a grounds for knowledge. Um, I mean, again, one issue with this position, which is kind of alluded to by Rini, uh, is that, again, the issue isn't necessarily us trusting uh, the AI content. It's it's that we start to discredit the validity of things like videos uh, and audio and that sort of a thing. And really, in our everyday lives, are we going to go around checking every single video uh, and ensuring that it is real. I, I'm not so certain that we would do that. Uh, so that could be a really big issue in that uh, maybe in like big court cases and stuff, we would be able to uh, find actual knowledge of a sort here. Um, but in our everyday lives, we'd still have this issue. Um, so yeah, I think that is, that is a, a potential problem there. Um, but again, I mean, this isn't all that different to the way that we looked at videos before AI technology in a sense, um, although I suppose it's more akin to being like just generally skeptical at all times of videos that existed before AI technology. Um, but, you know, I think the, the incentives for honesty are relatively the same in high impact situations. It's more the low impact situations where I think it gets a little bit dicey. Um, but anyway, thank you very much for watching. Hope you have found this valuable. Make sure to subscribe if you have. Uh, there should be a video on the screen right now for you to click, which will have another sick philosophy video on it. Uh, this channel is all about giving you uh, interesting insights into philosophical ideas, expanding your mind, making you think a little, giving you some cool ideas. So definitely click on that. Catch you in the next one. Peace.